Wales was linked to the Atlantic slave trade in several ways. Much of the story is quite grim. Other parts of it can be seen as very positive. And if there's one word that summarizes Wales's links with the slave trade at this time, it is complicated. The economic impact of this slavery was that a few Welsh people became very rich and some poorer Welsh people became a little bit better off, temporarily at least. And money from slavery helped to develop Welsh industries. There were notable figures in history who devoted their lives to abolishing the slave trade, including in Britain, William Wilberforce. The trade was made illegal in Britain in 1807 and slavery was finally outlawed in the British Empire in 1833. And there were quite a few Welsh people who made it their mission to stamp out slavery in Britain and beyond. Their names are not so well known today, but their work is worth remembering. But first, let's rewind to the 1600s, transporting captives from Africa to work on plantations in the Americas was becoming a big business. It was brutal and cruel, resulting in countless deaths at sea. Welsh sailors would have likely served on slave ships and Welsh pirates and privateers were involved. The most famous of them all, Captain Henry Morgan, the Cardiff man who became governor of Jamaica, owned slaves on three plantations. He also attempted to suppress a slave revolt. The infamous West Wales pirate Bartholomew Roberts, better known as Black Barty or Barty the set fire to a slave ship whose captain declined to pay a ransom. There was great loss of life. And as for that economic impact on Wales, first, copper from North Wales was made into ingots or copper bars. This was a currency made specifically to purchase slaves in West Africa, where copper was much prized. It was obvious what the copper ingots were for. They were known as Negroes. And when Swansea later became the copper smelting capital of the world, among its produce were boilers for the Caribbean sugar plantations. Anglesey man Thomas Williams, a lawyer and MP, became fabulously wealthy due to his copper and brass manufacturing enterprises in Wales. His company produced the pots and pans which were also used as currency for buying slaves in West Africa. The copper he produced was also used to sheath slave ships and others of course to protect the wooden hulls from attack by shipworm and marine growth. While the voices in favour of abolition grew louder in the late 1700s, Williams, along with other businessmen, wanted to maintain the status quo. He said he had invested £70,000 in his business and abolition of slavery would destroy his business and ruin the Welsh copper industry. Even much poorer people in Wales depended for a time on slavery for their livelihoods. Textile weavers in Mid Wales made a rough woolen cloth called Welsh Plain. It had long been sold throughout Europe, but the coming of mass production in textile factories produced better quality and lower cost fabrics, and so demand for Welsh Plain began to fall away. A new market had to be found, and so the thick fabric from rural Wales was sold to be worn by slaves in the heat of plantations of sugarcane, tobacco and cotton. Like the copper ingots, its purpose was made obvious. Welsh plain became better known as Negro cloth, and for a time the weavers thrived on this export. The population of Mid Wales even grew as a result, but the emancipation of slaves in the 1800s, along with that industrialised competition and exports hampered by war, killed the market and this rural part of Wales slipped back into relative poverty.
The abolitionist movement was growing strongly in the late 1700s and reports of extreme brutality garnered even more support from the general public. In 1781, more than 130 slaves on a British ship called Zong were deliberately thrown overboard to drown, simply to make an insurance claim. It appalled and enraged many and further stirred the public conscience. And there were Welsh people at home and abroad who were determined to do everything they could to end the evil of slavery. One prominent Welsh abolitionist, Flincher man, the Reverend Robert Everett, used the Welsh language to further his cause. Ordained in Denby, he emigrated to the United States in 1823 and became minister at a Welsh congregational church in Utica, New York State. He became a leader of the Welsh-speaking abolitionist movement. At that time, there were many Welsh emigrants in the USA, and the language was still in common use there, so Everett translated English-language abolitionist information into Welsh to get the message through to Welsh Americans. And as the editor of Er Canhador Americanaidh, the American missionary, he printed anti-slavery material and launched a campaign plan to draw Welsh Americans to the cause. His work made an impact, so much so that the Reverend Everett has been inducted into the American National Abolition Hall of Fame. Another key Welsh figure in America was Morgan John Fries, an ambitious and strong-minded man of Llanbradach, Glamorganshire. Born into modest circumstances, he studied and became a teacher and then a Baptist minister in Monmouthshire. Fired by idealism, he was inspired by the French Revolution and went to Paris, returning when the reality had not lived up to his hopes. He evolved into a fiery and radical politician. His writing in a political magazine promoting many causes was upsetting powerful people. He decided that it was time to leave Wales and he went to America in 1794. He preached there far and wide about the evils of slavery. He founded a Welsh emigration society and later bought a tract of land in Pennsylvania, which he called Cambria, and he founded a town there he named Bula. He attracted Welsh immigrants, but the settlement eventually faded away. Another who campaigned through the Welsh language, but in Wales, was William Williams of Pantacellin, Carmarthenshire. A prominent writer, he is the man who wrote the hymn, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, better known these days as Bread of Heaven. In the 1770s, a number of former slaves published their life stories, and Williams was the first to translate one of these into Welsh in 1762. People in what was still largely Welsh-speaking Wales could discover the cruel reality of slavery in their own language. Other prominent people in Wales also made well known their opposition to slavery. That complicated individual, Edward Williams, better known by his bardic name of Yolo Morganog, poet, radical, shopkeeper, stonemason and forger of literary works, was one of them. He refused to stock slave-grown sugar in his shop in Cowbridge in the Vale of Glamorgan. He had written, May the vast Atlantic Ocean swallow up Jamaica and all the other slave-trading and slave-holding countries before a boy or girl of mine eats a single morsel that would prevent him or her of perishing from hunger, if it is the produce of slavery. However, Yolo's two brothers were slave owners in Jamaica. They had a plantation with 240 slaves between them. And Yolo, although constantly broke, had long refused to take any money from them. But when one brother died and left him a hundred pounds in his will, Yolo took it, he said, to pay off his debts and also to help his son become a schoolmaster. The Black History Month magazine highlighted a similar embarrassment for a fervently abolitionist Welshman. 
The Reverend Thomas Coke of Brecon was a close associate of John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church. Coke was an intellectual still revered today for his tireless work. In the 1780s, Coke was sent to America to establish Methodism there. He was ordained a bishop, the very first Methodist bishop, and preached widely against slavery. This made him very unpopular with some. He then went to the Caribbean to set up Methodist missions. On the island of St. Vincent, he was given a plantation by the local government. And, well, perhaps you can guess what happened next. He had slaves to run it. Predictably, this apparent hypocrisy greatly angered fellow abolitionists, and he swiftly gave up the plantation. He admitted to his error, saying that he should not have done evil that good may come. In other words, he did the wrong thing for the right reasons. His biographer wrote, He did it with the best will in the world and with the intention of giving the slaves that he owned a decent life. The way that even people like Yolo Morganog and Thomas Coke ended up with financial involvement in slavery, despite their strong moral objections, is perhaps an indication of how insidious was the wealth from the slave trade and its application in the Americas. When the first step to challenge the slave trade reached Parliament in 1788, the most powerful Welsh voice raised against it was that of Richard Pennant, First Baron Penryn. He was the owner of Penryn Castle and also six sugar estates in Jamaica, with more than 600 slaves. He never visited his Jamaica estates, but the profits helped him develop the Welsh slate industry, including the Penryn Quarry. On that day in Westminster, Sir William Dolben spoke of the deaths that would be avoided if slave ships were not overcrowded and with deadly sanitation. Pennant argued that all this was unnecessary because ships' captains were already motivated to save lives for purely financial reasons. He lost that argument. The Slave Trade Act of 1788 was nothing more than a matter of regulation. It just limited the number of slaves that could be carried on a ship. The Society for the Abolition of the Slave Trade became ever more influential and worked for complete abolition in the years that followed. Many people in Wales supported its goals, and those abolitionists mentioned here were just the most prominent. So one question may be, how much influence did these Welsh campaigners have? Perhaps as individuals and even collectively it may not have been very much, but they played their part in growing a movement and building a critical mass that eventually, it would take decades more, but eventually brought to an end a sorry chapter in history. While the Atlantic slave trade may have been most visible on the other side of an ocean, it had strong links, good and bad, with Wales.